we're working with us on that. Good evening, everybody. Welcome in this snow environment that we've got here, the Snowmageddon. Hopefully this will be the last one for the year. But my kids are really enjoying it. So thank you for making uh, the effort to be here. We're really glad to see you. And I see some new faces. If I could embarrass all of you for your first time uh, for an event here, could you please just raise your hand? Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, very glad you're here. Uh, if you've not been to the museum before, I certainly encourage you to come back and take advantage of the main exhibit hall and see what it is that we have to offer here at the museum. Uh, if you have been here before, uh, you'll be interested know, to know that there are some changes in the main exhibit hall. I'm not going to tell you exactly where because I really want you to find them yourself, but we've made some changes in the World War I gallery, uh, particularly the, the entrance. You can't miss that change and uh, some other small areas throughout. And, um, uh, as we proceed through this year, we'll be planning uh, some additional updates to the uh, World War I exhibits in particular. We've made a change to the Cold War uh, exhibit case, and we still have some more work to do there. And we're going to be changing out the display cases in our Vietnam uh, jungle exhibit. So uh, I think you'll enjoy those uh, when they do happen. If you noticed in our gallery, in our lobby, we have a Revolutionary War howitzer. It's a replica of a howitzer, and that's, this was donated to us a few weeks ago during our uh, annual open house uh, event here at the museum by a local um, Revolutionary War reenactment group with the Northwest Territory Alliance. This is uh, Hamilton's artillery, and uh, they're very uh, close to Cantini Park here in the museum itself, and they wanted to uh, help us in our educational outreach programming, so they uh, offered to donate this howitzer to us. So it's on display in the lobby right now, and I uh, have a little information there about it if you care to um, find out about it. But you'll hopefully see that in some uh, education programs that we have uh, planned or um, probably later this year and, and definitely throughout next year. Um, also, you may have noticed uh, in the lobby uh, al along the wall a uh, display for Women's History Month. And this year, we are... Um, doing a series of heritage, uh, what we're calling Heritage Month exhibits. And uh, uh, last month we had an exhibit on Black History Month. And uh, to recognize Black History Month, we featured uh, some soldier stories from uh, the First Division. Um, and uh, this, this month, of course, is Women's History Month. And if you haven't seen it yet, um, uh, we're very honored to have been entrusted with the, uh, the effect, personal effects and the uh, award uh, medals and citations of Cheryl LeBeau O'Brien, who was the first woman killed in combat serving with the 1st Infantry Division during the uh, Desert Storm War in 1991. And tragically, um, uh, she was in a helicopter ferrying uh, uh, the remains of uh, dead 1st Division soldiers uh, to uh, transport them home. She was returning to the base two hours after the ceasefire was called and the Iraqis didn't know, the Iraqis in that area didn't know about it, and her helicopter sh got shot down, and she and uh, eight others were killed in that um, tragic, tragic event. But uh, fantastic um, that the family has uh, sought to uh, donate those materials to us, and we have uh, plans for uh, turning that into a permanent part of our exhibit uh, hall in the Desert Storm uh, section as you leave the main exhibit hall. Uh, also, uh, in this room, as you see, are, we're surrounded by photographs, and I hope you've had a chance to look around at them. This is a, a temporary exhibit that we're hosting here. It's entitled Conflict Zone, and it is a multimedia uh, exhibit. We have uh, film footage running and, and sounds and so on. Uh, if you get a chance to come back, I think you'll enjoy uh, seeing the whole um, 
experience, but it's the first show featuring several combat photographers who have never been really um, um, regularly uh, um, um, exposed to the American audience and whom uh, really deserve a wider recognition. Uh, and, and New York Times contract uh, photographer Zhao Silva was uh, severely injured in October 2010. And it was that event that caused a number of uh, his friends and con um, comrades in photography arms to uh, pool together their images that they had uh, produced in Iraq and Afghanistan and they wanted to create an exhibit to get word out about the sort of the realities of, of the frontline uh, experience but also uh, so that we can see what's going on uh, um, in, in those places. So uh, this, this exhibit features both civilian and military journalists and, um, and many are still currently deployed uh, on assignment. Uh, Silva, the, the person who was injured, was, uh, ed is uh, a co-editor of the exhibit, and um, it opened, the exhibit opened originally May 7th in 2011 here in Chicago, uh, and it's been traveling around the country ever since. And so we uh, will host it until April 19th. And in case you were looking for something to, to do next week, Thursday evening on the 14th, we are hosting a gallery talkback, which will be a tour of the exhibit by uh, Jackie Spinner, who was the co-director of the exhibit and a former Baghdad bureau, uh, bureau chief for the Washington Post. So she'll be here to uh, meet with us and to kind of walk around and tell us uh, uh, stories about the images and the photographers they represent. Tonight, uh, we kick off our Date with History series uh, events for 2013, and how appropriate then to uh, have found an incredible story right in our backyard uh, here um, to celebrate also Women's History Month. Tonight we have a presentation by Pauline Frazier and her biographer Louise Brass, and they will uh, uh, discuss Presenting Pauline, the remarkable story of Pauline Frazier's years as a London stage performer during World War II. Uh, through her life as a tap dancer, Frazier met some of the greatest military leaders, including Jimmy Doolittle and General George Patton and performed with Hollywood stars like Hermione Gingold. Uh, she even tr helped track spies for the British intelligence agency and even worked as a fire watcher uh, during the London Blitz. Uh, we talked about some of that uh, over dinner and, and I hope she'll uh, tell us some harrowing, what it was like to be in a bombing campaign in London during the Blitz because uh, if you've ever asked somebody, if you've never been in combat and ever asked somebody to describe it, they can't describe it and I was, I was captivated by how she was uh, talking about it herself. In 1945, Frazier married a uh, U.S. Army Air Force officer and came to the United States on the first war brides, war brides ship. They later settled in Naperville, Illinois, where Frazier directed dance and community theater. Louise Brass, uh, her biographer, is originally from London and now resides in, in the United States. She's the author of a detective miniseries and creator of a children's audio book. Brass is a former theater editor and columnist at Screen Magazine. So with that, I'd like uh, everyone to please welcome our presenters with a warm applause, and I'll turn it over to Pauline. British girls married Americans during World War II. Quite a few of them had families. And when the war was over, the government had to decide what to do with us. And uh, I guess they passed a bill in Congress to pay for our passage for all of us to come over to the United States. They requisitioned the Queen Mary, who was the bulk of Oh, now you can hear me, I hope. <laughs> Do I have to go over again, or did you hear me before? You heard me? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the Queen Mary was requisitioned to bring over these brides. But unfortunately, I was with the first shipment, and it was an old Red Cross ship called the Argentina. And this was February, 
and it was 1946, and normally you don't sail across the Atlantic at that time of the year. But they decided that this would be the right time to leave, so it took seven days for us to get to New York, and the mayor was there, and the bands were playing as we were, the first bride ship. Everybody had been seasick all the way over, and unfortunately, uh, one or two mothers lost their children. They were pregnant, and uh, they were so ill that they lost their babies. But anyway, to go back to the beginning, uh, Hitler invaded Austria, and we became very highly nervous in England what we were going to do. So Chamberlain went over to meet with Hitler in Munich, and they signed a peace pact. And it was in all the headlines when he came back saying, peace in our time. So one month later, we all started preparing for war because we knew it was inevitable. Women went out into the parks. They asked for volunteers to dig deep trenches in all the London parks. And we had many parks in England. So they dug these trenches and the idea was if we were caught out in an air raid, we could dive into one of these trenches and quite possibly our lives would be saved. And then one morning I got up and went outside and I saw all these balloons waving in the air. And they were called the balloon barrage. And the reason they were put up was the thought the Germans came over, they get tangled up in those wires and would bring the planes down. Of course, what happened to the people on the ground when the planes came down, I hate to think, but that's what the idea was. Unfortunately, they never brought any planes down. They weren't up high enough. Also, a lot of people don't know it, but 300 American pilots came to England before the war and called themselves the Eagle Squadron. They wore royal blue uniforms and their headquarters were about uh, one block from where we lived in Piccadilly. They learned to fly our Spitfires and Hurricane planes, and unfortunately, when the war ended, there was only one survivor. They had all been killed during the war. The next thing we knew was we were all sent notices to say everybody in England should carry a gas mask. So we all had to go to schools during the evening and be fitted for these masks. And they were nasty, smelly things, but we had to carry with them, with us, uh, throughout the whole war. Of course, you couldn't put a gas mask on a baby, so the babies were put in cylinders, and they were beds. And the idea was, if there was a chemical gas warfare, uh, that the Germans would be dropping uh, these things. Uh, the babies would have this little glass, plexiglass pulled up, turn the knob, and that was supposed to filter out the gas. Because I don't know if the baby would end up suffocating because after all, if everything was closed up, they couldn't very well breathe, but I never really went into all that. But that was the general idea of it. Uh, also, another idea of the government was we have to evacuate all the children into the countryside if war is declared. Well, uh, that was a great upheaval. Parents, it wasn't compulsory, but a lot of parents said they were willing to let the children go. They also asked for volunteers to help evacuate these children. And my mother volunteered and asked if I could go along as well if this should happen. Well, Hitler started to mass on the borders of Czechoslovakia, and it looked like there wasn't going to be peace in our time. So they decided all of a sudden, towards the end of August, 1939, that they would not wait, they'd go ahead with the evacuation of the children. Before then, inspectors from the government went throughout the countryside and you could not refuse to allow them to go in your home. 
And they could go in these homes and count the bedrooms. And if you had three bedrooms, they'd tell you to double up. One bedroom was for an evacuee. And they would pay their room and board as long as they were there. They would pay all their expenses. So my mother volunteered to help. And towards the end of October, I think it was the end of August, we got a notice in the mail that we're not going to wait any longer. They were going ahead with the mass evacuation of the children. So they asked us to be at the railroad station early next morning at six o'clock. So we went there and she was asked if I could go along. And that it was just swarming the station with children crying, mothers crying. Anyway, we finally were well, first of all, we were given a big label with our name and addresses on it, but nobody had any idea where we were going. Anyway, we got onto the train, and we ended up at a country, little country town called Bury St. Edmunds. And uh, there were buses waiting for us, took us to the local town hall, and we sat there on benches, and gradually mothers came in and said, I'll take two children, I'll take one child. Maybe a farm woman would come in and said, I'll take three. And gradually they were all dispersed. So my mother and I were waiting to come back to London and an officer came in and said, no, you cannot go back for at least two weeks. You have to make sure they're all settled in. So he said, I've uh, found out that there's a gamekeeper at an estate near here. They have an extra bedroom and they will put you up and he said, we will pay your room and board while you're here. So every day a car came by, I'd take my mo mother around to these different places, and she would check with the people, make sure they were happy and satisfied where they were. I also forgot to mention that pregnant, well, not pregnant women, but women with babies could also be evacuated, and the government would pay for them. But they did not settle too well because they were always worried what their husbands were up to in London while they were in the countryside. So quite a few of them decided to go back, which they did. They couldn't stop them. So anyway, after two weeks, my mother and I went back to London. I might add that at that time, I was in a show in London and I had to write to the manager to say, you know, I wouldn't be back for two weeks because of the evacuation. But of course, they didn't fire me. There wasn't much they could do about it. Well, while we were in the country, on September 3rd, we went to a church service, the local church. And then the vicar, he interrupted. He was giving a talk, and a religious talk. And he said, I'm sorry, I have to tell you right now we have declared war on Germany. Germany is entering into Poland, and uh, we are now at war. So my mother and I went back to London, and uh, everything was very quiet. We expected to be raided right away, we looking at the sky, expecting to see the German planes coming over, and nothing happened. Everything was very quiet. So. Now we were in war, we had to get serious about everything. They decided to black out the entire country so not a spot of light would show from the air. So all the headlights were taken out of all the cars and little tiny blue bulbs were put in. In the shops there were little blue bulbs all around so you could just see in, but nobody could see out. Well, you can, uh, wouldn't reflect on the outside so they couldn't see any lights from the air. And we all had flashlights, which we had to hold down when we were walking in the street. We had to go to the shops and buy yards of blackout material, put these curtains at all the windows, so not even a chink of light would show. Of course, no neon lights, nothing at all like that. Actually, really, in some ways, it was a waste of time because the Germans knew exactly where they were when they were coming to London because Southern Ireland was all lit up like a Christmas tree. I mean, and when they saw those lights, they knew where they were going. But 
As I say, the whole country was in darkness. And uh, we had to think right away about air raid shelters. Where will we go in if there's a raid? So we were all given passes for various shelters. You had to go in the shelter that they designated you to. Now the first shelter we went, they made a big mistake. We were asleep one evening and all of a sudden the sirens went. We hadn't heard them before. Of course, everyone gets scared, and well, here come the bombers. So the manager of the apartment house we were in, he said, don't bother to even dress. He said, just put your dressing gowns on. Come quickly, we've got to get to the shelter. And our shelter was the Café de Paris, which was underground, two floors down. So here we are in our dressing gowns and slippers, racing to the Café de Paris. We went down in the elevator, doors open, there's a band playing, everyone's in evening dress, they're all dancing around, and we're standing there in our night clothes. <laughs> so the, the manager said, what are you doing? And so we said, well, this is our air raid shelter. So he said, well, okay, I'll, there's a table over in the corner, all go over and sit there and I'll send you a cup of coffee. So we had to stay there till the all clear went, and then of course we came up. Well, uh, that was the last time we were in the Café de Paris because he complained immediately to the government and they gave us a pass to go to the department store, Russell's department store, where we could sleep between the aisles in the basement. Of course it was concrete floor, but that was it. So that's where we went afterwards. Almost uh, right away came in rationing. Because well, England was never self-supporting, we imported most of our food. And already the submarines were sinking ships, the ships that were coming to England with food. So we went into severe rationing. Not only food, clothing. All clothing was Russian right away. And you had to give coupons, so many for a dress, so many for a coat. Very difficult. And shoes, all shoes were Russian. We had to give coupons for shoes. And then uh, of course a general call up. You see, after they declared, declared war, our troops naturally went over to France. It was a general call up. The women, exactly the same as men, 18, you had to go. You had a choice, you go in the forces or you go in munitions. The only exemptions were if you were married or married with children. And you'd be amazed how many young girls got married in a hurry, so I, <laughs> I didn't have to go. But uh, the troops were fighting in France and I gather that the Germans, of course, went through Belgium, round the Maginot Line like nothing at all, and uh, they threatened to bomb Paris. So France capitulated. We were on our own, our troops in France, fighting a rear guard action. And they all ended up in the beaches of Dunkirk, sort of a seaside town. And. Uh, one night, there were thousands of them on the beaches, absolutely thousands, with all their equipment that they could bring with them. Churchill went on the radio one night, and he said, I want everybody in England who has a boat of any description that will sail on water to go down to the docks. And I, cannot, I think it was Southampton, but I'm not sure. He said, there the warships will be. He said, then they'll tell you what to do. So this little martyr went all the way down to coast and uh, they were told by the captain of the warships that they were all going to sail to Dunkirk and they were to bring home as many men as possibly they could. If there was only two and three of them on a small boat, that was it. So the little armada followed the warships to Dunkirk. And, and they were told the soldiers to leave everything on the beaches. Don't bring anything back with you except yourselves. Don't pick up anything. 
So gradually, I think they rescued close to 36,000 men came back eventually. And when they came back, we had to start from scratch and equip them all over again. Now, as I said, we had this severe rationing going on. And uh, they only have you got an extra coupon if you were getting married for the wedding cake. They gave you a few extra coupons for sugar and flour, etc. We had one kind of bread, dark brown. It was supposed to be full of nutriments. And we, the, all of us ate this bread throughout the war. When we first started eating it, we all got indigestion. <laughs> it took a while for our stomachs to get used to it. But once we did, it was very healthy and uh, I really enjoyed it, and it was a boost, I mean, to have uh, have these extra bread. I mean, and potatoes were not rationed. So we had a lot of potato pancakes. That would be my dinner sometimes, a big potato pancake. Now, uh, I did have another list here, but anyway, I'll go on. Another weapon that the Germans were sending over, well, I might go back to the fact after that first raid in London, our Churchill, who was now the Prime Minister, had replaced Chamberlain. He was so furious that he said, we are now going to ra raid Berlin next night. So our squadron got together, uh, the, the bomber squadron, and they went over to Berlin. That was all lit up because they never expected to be bombed. And they, of course, they dropped their bombs on Berlin. So Hitler was so infuriated, the next night he made a big speech, and he said, from now on, we're going to bomb all the cities. Before, he was bombing all the airfields, but now they were going to bomb all the cities. And that's when it really started. <laughs> and it really started in London and all the other cities. It was very, very bad, the bombing, as we shall see in the pictures here. We were bombed from then on almost every night, except when the weather was very bad, and then, of course, we had reprieve for a, a night or so. But about 40,000 people were killed in London in a very short time. And it, that's when it was so terribly hard on our soldiers overseas to receive a telegram saying, I'm sorry, but uh, your family was killed last night along with your home, and that was it. So they had sort of added anxiety on top of everything else. The Germans, after a short while, came over, came up with something new. They call, we call them the buzz bombs. They were tiny little pilotless planes, and they were jet propelled, and they all came over from the coast of France, and they would fly overhead, it would look like a swarm of bees, and made a terrific noise. And then the minute they ran out of fuel, there was deathly silence, that meant they were coming straight down, and then there would be a colossal explosion. This was really very, very dangerous, uh, but at least you had some warning that when there was silence, you had a few minutes to look for some kind of shelter before they exploded. Then the next very worst thing was the V-2 rocket. We were down a shelter one night, and normally at 6 o'clock, uh, the all clear would sound, and we would all come up and go home or go to work. But this particular evening, we were in the shelter, six o'clock, seven o'clock. It was getting on for 10 o'clock, and there was no all clear. Nobody could understand what was going on. So finally we said, well, we've all got to go. So we all left the shelter. And then Churchill went on the radio. He said, the Germans have a new weapon. They, we call it the V2. And he said, it's faster than sound. We cannot give you any kind of a warning. You just have to brace up and uh, 
do the best we can and we'll hopefully we'll try to find the bases they're coming from. As they were wheeling them around in these big trolleys, they could just move them to different places. It was very hard to track them. So they did a tremendous amount of damage. And uh, the only time that they stopped coming over is when we had D-Day and the Americans and the British were on the French soil and they gradually came across these bases and they were able to stop it. But they scared the absolute daylights out of everybody. I am slightly deaf because one fell near me and I couldn't hear for three days. It made such a, a noise. They knocked down a church and two buildings either side. And of course my hearing came back, but you know, old age. <laughs> I have a little hard of hearing now, <laughs> thanks to that damn rocket. <laughs> but now, uh, what is the time, dear? I believe I have to turn the meeting over to uh, Louise, who will tell you a little bit about this book, Presenting Pauline, came to be published. Uh, there's different excerpts in it uh, about uh, as I say, eating uh, on Sundays at General Doolittle's headquarters and many other things. Having General Patton for lunch was very entertaining. So, all right, I'll turn this over to Louise. Thank you to the uh, First Division Museum and everybody who has been so welcoming to us tonight and uh, to talk about Pauline's adventures during, in London during World War II and her, about her memoir and how the performing arts and history really do intersect at certain times in history. Uh, the dramatic historical events can have a huge influence on the arts and vice versa. In fact, they can play off one another in world-changing ways. War movies can bring information and understanding that can't always be garnered from basic reports of what's occurring on the battlefield. But those entertainment vehicles also have a responsibility to protect, project truthfully the events that are changing the world. And of course, when filmmakers or playwrights get involved, other issues and agendas can sometimes blur the historical facts or may miss the big picture. But I think the dramatic endeavors seen on the stage in the silver screen in the World War II era played a patriotic and truly informative, they were patriotic and, and informative while adding the entertainment value that audiences demand. And many of those movie uh, productions remain classic icons of the film industry today. Pauline's own story begins before World War II, a real trooper. She became a tap dancer on the stage and toured with tap dance companies from the age of about eight. And learning all about Pauline's work, including her being a film extra in some of Alfred Hitchcock's early movies, such as Sabotage, and her other stage performances during the 1930s and 40s, prompted me to take a look at the connection between the performing arts and historical events. Throughout my writing career, I have met some truly intriguing people, but I have to say I've never met anyone who has had such a fascinating life as Pauline. Full of surprises, she was even asked by British intelligence to do some spy tracking, and some disappointments too, of course, and some events that seemed to be truly Pauline's destiny, as predicted by her grandmother not long after she was born in the small Lincolnton, Lincolnshire town of Grantham, England. Grantham is also the town, by the way, where Margaret Thatcher, England's first woman prime minister, lived as a child. In fact, the Iron Lady, as Mrs. Thatcher was called, and Pauline played together as very young children in Mrs. Thatcher's father's grocery store. Mm -hmm. And as I learned more details of Pauline's life, I realized that she is a very courageous person, and it was her type of courage and her type of sense of humor that helped to win the war. That was my grandparents' and my parents' war. And her life story reflects that perseverance and the elan of those who withstood Hitler's onslaughts both on and off the field of battle. And I often wondered where that kind of strength comes from. Of course, many cups of tea helped. And during the Second World War in England, tea often had to be brewed in dark, dank air raid shelters, or in half-bombed out homes with no glass left in their windows, or in chilly church halls where families could take refuge when their houses were destroyed. Even for homes left standing, electricity was often knocked out by the attacks, and cities were left with no power. 
So any non-literal point of light was important to keep aglow, so to speak, in those times. The theater was one such point of light and often provided something to smile about, to laugh about, to enjoy, even while history was in the making outside the theater walls. So the theater provided an escape from reality and from the horrors of war. Those entertainment opportunities were rare during World War II, of course, but very important in helping people forget for a few hours the devastation happening all around them. Keeping alive as many traditions as possible, even four o'clock tea time, no matter how inf insignificant that might seem to some, was vital. Strength was found in cherished traditions, such as flower shows and garden fates, or Christmas caroling, or having Sunday dinner with the family, although food was scarce then, of course, and families were very often fractured by the war. I'm sure that maintaining these kinds of activities when possible must have made the difference to many of the people of Great Britain during those years of nerve-wracking day days and terrorizing nights. But entertainers such as Pauline lived on a different timetable from most of the population, so they were able to get some rest during the daytime because of the bombing. And at least for the first half of the war, were conducted, the bombing was conducted mostly during the night. And when the theater curtains rose and the shows began in the evening, the air raids soon followed, shutting down the clubs and theaters and ruining most people's sleep. But in the daytime, when the skies were actually free of bombers, theater people could at least get some rest. By fulfilling her calling as an entertainer, a tap dancer, and a young review artist, Pauline helped the war effort, and so in her own way, contributed to the Allies' victory in World War II, even though she never wore a uniform or carried a gun. How about a knife for a weapon, Pauline? Well, that's all in her book, Presenting Pauline. And I'm often asked, how did this book, Presenting Pauline, come about? Well, it was the spring of 2010 when, over a cup of tea with friends, that Pauline, knowing I'm a writer, asked me to work with her on a memoir, and I accepted this book project without any qualms because Pauline had often mentioned her many World War II adventures. And being a fire watcher on the roof of the Ambassador's Theater during the bombing raids, doing some spy catching at the request of British intelligence, and turning down a date with Prince Philip of Greece when he was a young naval officer, which is some of her experiences. Prince Philip at that time was not yet engaged to marry the future Queen Elizabeth II of England, which she did in 1947. So Pauline and I met every two weeks for about six months to discuss her experiences, and after about a year, we started this book. We had completed the book project, and that was also after many cups of tea, and then we were published. And I was intrigued with the fact that Pauline had so many near misses of many kinds as a young tap dancer and review artist. Even her time in Hollywood as a teenager, she was there for two years, accompanied by her devoted mother, who you might be able to see behind us in a moment wearing a fur hat, could have opened the way to international stardom for her, but that was cut short by the start of World War II and prompted their return home to London. Somehow Pauline managed to avoid the Luftwaffe bombing raids while performing on stage and then while running home through the streets of London, trying not to be struck by falling debris during those dark and dangerous nights of the London Blitz. During the war, her mother, Louisa Mabbott, would often come to the theater to wait for her. Then they would walk or more often run home to the questionable safety of their fourth floor flat. The theater group Pauline was performing with in 1943 and 44 at the Ambassador's Theater in London did comedy reviews and skits. And the shows called Sweet and Low the first year and then Sweeter and Lower the next year were very well received by the audience that included many troops and military people of all ranks who were about to embark on the tremendous fight to free Europe from the horrors of the Nazi occupation took time to attend the show and maybe found a way to forget what lay ahead. Sweet and Low included the famed comedian Hermione Gingold. Gingold later played the mother of Gigi in the movie of the same name opposite Leslie Caron and Maurice Chevalier. Performers on the London stage during World War II had to stay on stage as long as there were people in the audience who tr chose not to seek an air raid shelter when the bombs started falling. And the bombs fell almost every night during the Blitz. In the audience one night was the great US flying ace Major General Jimmy Doolittle. And I'll read a short piece from Pauline's memoir about that episode in chapter 17 called Lunch with the Generals. 
Gingold was a wonderful person and certainly a great entertainer. She could make friends easily when she wanted to. At one point during the war, she became friendly with the brave and daring U.S. Army Air Force Major General James Doolittle. He was famous for his Doolittle Raiders. The Raiders, all volunteers, flew the first retaliation air raid on Japan in 1942 with a squadron of bombers. Doolittle was a colonel at that time. Some bombers, included Doolittles, ran out of fuel and crash landed in China. Most of the crew escaped the Japanese, who at that time were occupying parts of China. By 1944, Doolittle was promoted to Major General and in, was in London helping plan the D-Day invasion. But to take his mind off the fighting, at least one would imagine that was so, he came to our show at the Ambassador's Theatre. One evening during the show, we heard a lot of laughter and applause from one of the boxes. It turned out to be Major General Doolittle and his staff thoroughly enjoying the acts. Afterwards, he said he'd had such a good time that he just had to come backstage and meet Gingold. Doolittle told the management of the theatre that he would like to pop in and see the performances whenever he was in London. So he took a box for the run of the show. But he said that on the nights that he wasn't there, if the theater was full and any other soldiers came in looking for seats, they could have his box. He was good that way. He was a jolly little guy. He became highly decorated and famous for building the morale of the United States military because of his daring Tokyo raid. Keeping up morale is vital in wartime. During Sweeter and Lower, in 1944, a lot of Americans were coming to see us perform. We loved to have them in the audience. The Americans always seemed to enjoy a lively show, and I got quite a few fan letters. Doolittle and Gingold enjoyed each other's company very much. I guess somewhere in their conversation, she let the general know that the food rationing was weakening our dancing abilities. Although my aunts would send some food items from Grantham when they could, we were still feeling the effects of the lack of enough to eat. It seemed evident that Doolittle felt quite sorry for us performing on short rations. He told Hermione that he would send a car to the stage door once a month on a Sunday afternoon to take her and the rest of the company down to his house in High Wycombe. We would join him for a full and very delicious lunch and high tea at the house, which was also his headquarters, he said. Then we will see that you are all driven back to the stage door, he assured her. We only needed to let him know how many were coming and he would know how many cars to send for us. We were all very excited about going. As planned, two unmarked army cars picked us up and we were off to a very scrumptious steak and potato lunch and later in the afternoon, a divine high tea. The general's house was a large, attractive, mock Tudor style home that had been requisitioned during the war for his use because he was in charge of the United States 8th Army. About six or seven people were living in the house, including two or three colonels. After lunch, Doolittle would sit around chatting with us about show business. We talked a lot about the theater. One afternoon, he told us that he used to be a very good acrobat. We looked at each other in disbelief, but tried to humor him. Oh yes, I'm sure you were, we all said, smiling at one another. I think he must have read the disbelief in our eyes, so the general insisted on proving his claim. I'll show you. Move all the chairs back, he commanded, smiling as he took off his jacket. We moved the chairs out of the way as he went to the end of the room. Then after a moment's pause, he did perfect handsprings from one of the end of the room to the other. He wasn't very tall, so he was able to move across the room with ease. We were really quite surprised and gave him a big round of applause. He looked very pleased with himself. You would have thought he'd just won an Olympic gold medal. In fact, during his lifetime, he was awarded far more important medals, the Medal of Honor, the Medal of Freedom, two Distinguished Service Medals, the Silver Star, three Distinguished Flying Crosses, the Bronze Star, and four Air Medals. Most of the show's cast came regularly each month for the afternoon with the general. We also became good friends with his staff. It was a pleasant relief from our usual schedules. One wintry afternoon, as soon as we arrived, Doolittle said, I have a very interesting person coming for lunch. We were all trying to imagine who it might be. He couldn't keep us in suspense for long. I'll tell you who it is. It's General George Patton. He said he's going to be my guest today. Just thought I'd read you that little excerpt from the book and uh, read about the rest, in, uh, the rest of the encounter in the book. It's intriguing to me how performing arts and history often link together. Shows, plays, and movies can play important roles in the course of human events, inspiring and informing as well as entertaining when pre presenting truths in the storyline. Some of the great Academy Award films of the World War II area, era, era display this 
respect, and such as Mrs. Miniver starring Greer Gass and Water Pigeon, which Pauline says is very reflective of what actually happened to many families, might have, I surmised, helped in some way to encourage the United States to come to England's rescue, which it did, of course. If it hadn't, I seriously doubt we would be here tonight. Mrs. Miniver is said in England during the time of the heroic rescue of thousands of troops trapped on the coast of France at Dunkirk. They were cut off by the advancing German forces and some French troops escaped at Dunkirk and became known as the, French, the Free French Forces. Their symbol was the Cross of Lorraine and that was also the symbol of the, symbol of the French resistance. The double-barred cross can be seen today on memorials to those who lost their lives fighting the Nazis in France. The Free French were led by Major General uh, or by General Charles de Gaulle, who also escaped at Dunkirk, and he set up his he headquarters in London just before the Battle of Britain began. A film with the title The Cross of Lorraine, made in 1943, tells the story of the French resistance and the Free French forces, and stars Jean Kelly and Jean-Pierre Armand. In the 1942 black and white movie, Mrs. Miniver, she herself was left alone while her husband sailed across the English Channel with the rescue armada of the little boats to Dunkirk. And this film, I believe, gives another example of the importance of keeping spirits up on the home front. The tagline for the movie is, when Hitler did his worst, Mrs. Miniver did her best. Her best included cornering a down German pilot in her kitchen until the police arrived while her children slept upstairs. Oh, the ingenuity of a housewife. And another film set in World War II, but made some 40 years later, is the engrossing and engaging thriller called Shining Through with Melanie Griffith and Michael Douglas. Griffith plays a secretary turned secret agent who travels undercover to Germany. And I think the story really demonstrates the immense courage an untrained civilian can exhibit when asked to track spies and when the cause is vital enough to risk everything. I believe this film, based on the best-selling novel of the same name by Susan Isaacs and released in 1992, was to be shot in Budapest, Hungary in the late 1980s. But when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, filming was able to take place in the very locations that the story is set in, Berlin and Potsdam, adding an authenticity to this production. One of the most famous World War II movies, of course, is the iconic and much-loved film Casablanca, where Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman almost rekindled an old romance as they tried and succeeded to outwit the enemy. An engaging film was released to the public in 1942 to coincide with the Allies' invasion of North Africa. So publicity works both ways. Casablanca won three Academy Awards and is ranked today by the Writers Guild of America West as the best of the 101 greatest screenplays ever written. This artistic endeavor certainly must have given hope to those who wondered in 1942 if the war could ever really be won. Of course, with Humphrey Bogart on your side, how could you lose? It was the actual, at the actual city of Casablanca, Morocco, in January 1943, in newly liberated French North Africa, that British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt met and coordinated the next stage of their joint war policy, reaffirming the need for unconditional surrender of Germany and Japan. They made this their goal, their unalterable policy, and they stuck to it. And one of my uncles served in North Africa in the British Army under Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, better known as Monty. Uh, my uncle told me that once, he told me once that the performing arts played a big part in his wartime experiences. He volunteered to get involved with an amateur theater production there, which was put on during the lull in the desert fighting. The show was by the troops, for the troops. Unfortunately, my uncle was not really a singer or dancer. He said he did it for altruistic reasons but he admitted he gave, it gave him a chance to get out of KP duty. In 1940, of course, Field Marshal Montgomery led the British Expeditionary Force in France, but was forced to retreat at Dunkirk during Germany's Western Offensive. Later, he was chosen by Churchill to command the Eighth Army in North Africa, which repelled German forces in November 1942 at El Alamein, and Churchill was quoted, quoted as saying, before El Alamein, we never had a victory. After El Alamein, we never had a defeat. So Churchill really had a way with words, and I understand he spent at least 60 hours preparing for every speech he made. So while audiences in America were watching the movie Casablanca, Roosevelt and Churchill were at that location, busy formula formulating their crucial plans. And at Casablanca was solidified the Anglo-American agreement not to launch the English Channel crossing to liberate German-occupied Europe until the early summer of 1944, 
because of supply and preparation considerations, it was a huge undertaking. It would be the biggest armada the world had ever seen. Leading, the leading American diplomat at the time, Avril Harriman, special envoy to Churchill and Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, is reported to have said that during the Casablanca conference, Churchill and Roosevelt appeared disappointed by the slowness of the move towards the liberation of occupied Europe. But for such a massive endeavor, it is not surprising that it took time to prepare and to make, vic make sure of victory because the 1940 calamity of Dunkirk was certainly fresh in everyone's memories. All the while, Jewish people by the tens of thousands from many occupied countries were being loaded onto trains and sent to gas chambers where they were systematically destroyed by the Nazis. One of the most poignant and telling films that depict this great tragedy is a more recent one called The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. This historical dra drama, released in 2008, is based on the novel by John Boyne. The film explores the horrors of the Holocaust through the eyes of an eight-year-old boy. Set in 1944, it has been criticized by some, saying children were not in such places as, as Auschwitz. However, officials Official reports indicate that more than 600 male children under the age of eight were outswitched and were used as messengers before also being killed. In all, about 1.5 million children died at the hands of the Nazis, according to the Center for the Holocaust Studies in New York. It, I believe it is a film worth watching. It shows that when horror is inflicted on others, it eventually will turn back on the perpetrators themselves, and that's called justice. Certainly, World War II has given playwrights, authors, and Hollywood plenty of storylines to work with, focusing on the effects the war has had on many different countries, from the enchanting and much more lighthearted musical set in Austria, The Sound of Music, starring Julie Andrews and Christopher Plummer, to more dramatic movies. But The Sound of Music in 1965, Academy Award-winning film, is based on the book, The Story of the Trapp Family Singers, by Maria von Trapp, a nun turned stepmother with seven children, who Julie Andrews portrays in the film. In 2001, The Sound of Music was selected by the Library of Congress for preservation by the National Film Registry for its historical importance as well as its cultural and aesthetic significance. Julie Andrews herself came to the London stage as a young girl a few years after Pauline. Andrews recalls in her memoir her impressions of Winston Churchill who came to see her perform in My Fair Lady in London in the 1950s. Andrews recalls Churchill as a much-loved and extraordinary man and the night he attended the theater, she wrote, the cast gave probably their most meaningful performance. I imagine that was because Churchill was greatly respected for being an inspiring and visionary leader. He led without flinching the fight against the Nazis, and he struggled so determinedly, so doggedly, for a better world against great odds, and he wouldn't give in. Pauline notes in her memoir how Churchill, during his radio addresses, tried to encourage Brit British people never to give up the fight, even if it came to hand-to-hand -hand combat in the streets, the fields, and the beaches of the homeland. Pauline's mother, however, expressed doubt that the British people would actually fight in the fields and the ditches if the Germans were able to invade the little island nation as they planned to. Personally, I'm, I'm sure the British people who have not been invaded for 1,000 years would have put up a good fight had the invasion actually happened, even if they only had cricket bats to defend themselves with. And the spirit of endurance was obvious in the sacrifices made early in World War II during the Battle of Britain. In July, from July to October 1940, when the Royal Air Force was outnumbered by the Luftwaffe more than three to one in the air. British Spitfire and Hurricane pilots bravely fought off the Gem Germans who were flying Messerschmitts and Junkers. But the RAF flyers, so young and so enthusiastic to do their part, were often only minimally trained because of the emergency, but they let Hitler know in no uncertain terms that he was in for more trouble than he realized when he tried to take over Great Britain. And while the Battle of Britain raged overhead, Churchill's radio speeches were most likely broadcasted from his secret war rooms deep under London. Many decades later, those war rooms were revealed to the public and opened for tours. I believe we owe so much to all those who struggle against evil, whatever their role, public or private, military or civilian, on the stage or behind the scenes, when they make a stand against the forces of darkness. So thank you, thank you to all who served and are serving today. Tonight, this museum is a place where the performing arts and history meet. And before we do the book signing, Pauline would be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Pauline about her days of entertainment or, or when she met uh, the generals, Patton? Do little.
Yes? Mentioned in, it was mentioned in the flyer that she was a spy catcher during the war. Um, what was she doing as a spy catcher? Can you tell us a little about what you were doing as a spy catcher during the war? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was working in a nightclub at the time. And of course, which I haven't mentioned in my, well, I have actually mentioned in the book, I was in the United States when I was 12 years old. I went to Hollywood, and being a little girl with a British accent, I was in quite a few movies. So, uh, what was the question? You knew, you knew about America, so you were at the cabaret. She was at the cabaret club I was at, when, when she was When I approached. went back to England, mm -hmm. I was at the cabaret club in a floor show there, and uh, the manager who ran the club, he asked me to go in his office, and he said, uh, you've spent time in America, haven't you? And I said, oh, yes. I said, uh, we went by Greyhound from New York to California to Hollywood and then back again. And I was in school for about a year in Bancroft Junior High School. As a matter of fact, who was in school with me, my class, and we shared a sewing machine together was Judy Garland. She was Judy Gum at that time, but uh, she became Judy Garland. We used to giggle all through because neither of us could make head or tail of a sewing machine, so that was it. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we, uh, I went back to England when I was uh, 14, and uh, then uh, later on I was at this cabaret club, and the manager said, you spent time in the United States, haven't you? I said, yes. Told him a little bit about it. So he says, a gentleman sitting out in the club tonight would like to talk to you. So uh, between the shows, I went to sit and talk to him, an elderly gentleman. He asked me a lot about America and what uh, schooling I'd been to and had I really knew Americans. And I said, certainly do. So he said, well, I'll be in touch with you. So then about two or three weeks later, he uh, came in again and he said, you might be able to work for us. So I said, well, what work? He said, well, it'll be government work. He said, uh, there's a lot of people over here posing as Americans who are not Americans and we're not quite sure what some of them are up to. But he said, if you knew them, you probably could tell right away whether they'd actually been to America or not. So I said, oh, lovely, yes, I'll do that. So, uh, I reported to him a couple of times of uh, people I'd met. One man said he had a big munitions factory in the States and this and that. And I knew he'd never been to America. He was from the north of England. He uh, certainly wasn't American. So I reported that to this police inspector. That's where he told me to report, the police station. And then one night, uh, a car came for me and the manager said, uh, this gentleman wants you to go to his home. He wants to talk to you some more. So this big car came and uh, I didn't even have time to take my makeup off between shows. So I just went as I was. I went to this big house in Kensington and uh, very opulent looking and the butler let me in. And I went to this very beautiful drawing room and this gentleman was there, and he asked me if I want a cup of tea and what have you. And I talked some more, some more to him, and he said, you've been very useful. We'd like to use you uh, when you can, to keep your job, but you can spot these people, let us know right away. So of course, finally, my mother knew nothing about this. So I finally figured it about time I told her, so I told her. And she said, absolutely no way. She said, who the hell do you think you are, Mata Hari? And you know what happened to her. So that was the end. I had to tell the gentleman, very sorry, I can't spy for you anymore. And that was the end of my spying career. But it was a lot of fun. Any other questions? Thank you very much for being here tonight. This is fantastic. I, I read a lot about the the war during the Battle of Britain when the first few months from September and uh, September on in 1940, the, the summer up to September 1940, were you ever, did they ever 
witness any of the, the dog fighting when the Messerschmitts and Spitfires would come in during that, that summer, the summer of 1940? Were they right over London, or what was that like? Did you see any of the fighting between the tanks here? Oh, yes, the you mean, uh, yes, the, the battles that went on? They Breath mainly were over the coast. So I didn't see too many, because uh, the fighter planes were either waiting for them when they came in, because we had developed radar, and we had these big towers all around the coast. Or otherwise, uh, when they were going back over the channel, there'd be uh, air fights and that. We have a person here tonight who is uh, one of those planes who unfortunately was shot down over Germany and became a prisoner of war. And Mr. Glenn King, King is sitting right there, and he knows more about that than I do. Okay. So uh, we did not see what I call many dogfights. Thank Not you. over the cities, anyway. They, they didn't do it over. They preferred to wait until they got out more in the countryside before they did that. Well, I guess the second part of the question is, how did the people keep up their morale during that time? I mean, they must have been terrified and kind of way back at, uh, they're not sure what's going to happen. Uh, once, once the Germans finished off the, the Air Force, the, the British Air Force, there was nothing stopping them, right? Well, I, uh, we, may, we used to have a song. We're going to hang up the washing on the seat for each line. Do you have any dirty washing, Mother dear? And it was that kind of sense of humor that kept us going through. I mean, uh, the English would always see some sort of a humorous side to things. And we became kind of fatalistic to a certain extent as well. We used to say, about the bombing, well, if it's got your number on it, that's it, you know. It uh, was sort of a fatalistic attitude that we developed. And of course, it was unbelievable that anybody could uh, invade England. And I remember once I was in the kitchen with my mother and I said, what's gonna happen if the Germans do invade? I mean, what am I going to do? So she, we went in the kitchen, she pulled out the kitchen drawer and she said, I've got two sharp knives there. And when they come through that door, we'll get as many as we can before they get us. <laughs> and I thought, well, that makes common sense. I never worried about it much after that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I've met a few ladies that were war brides, but uh, never got any of their stories. What was your experience being a war bride coming from England to the United States? And usually they had to do a lot of paperwork. It was an entirely different environment um, coming. How were you accepted once you got to the United States? Oh, very well accepted. Never had any problem at all. I was on, as I say, the first bride ship, and um, the husbands were supposed to meet us elsewhere in a meeting room, but my husband sneaked on deck, so I was sort of one of the first uh, brides, you know, to meet her husband, so we had our picture in all the New York papers on the front page, greeting that, and uh, I think quite a few of them acclimatized themselves very well. And they were very welcome. Of course, eventually there were a few divorces here and there. The girls homesick and uh, wanted to go back to England. But the majority of them stayed here, raised families, and were quite happy. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. If you could uh, please uh, stay there for just a few seconds more. We do this to all of our uh, honored speakers and guests. 
We have uh, some very useful water bottles with the 1st Infantry Division logo on the front and the 1st uh, uh, Division Museum logo on the front. So they're a uh, small token of our appreciation, but we're very, very, uh, very happy to have had you tonight. Uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Um, so that you know, there are uh, copies of the book uh, for sale out in the lobby, and they'll be very happy to sign it for you if you're interested in having a copy. Uh, but please uh, give them a chance to you know, get some water and, and make their way back to the table, and they'll be very happy to talk to you um, about any questions you have. And um, if you're new to our events and haven't been here before, uh, you should know that we take donations from the Midwest Shelter of Homeless Veterans. Uh, we're very um, involved in supporting that group here in Wheaton, Illinois, a very worthwhile effort. And um, uh, please see our um, American Legion representatives out in the lobby, and they'll be very happy to give you further information if you'd like. So again, thank you very much, and, uh, and please come back. <laughs> I have some pictures here if you want to look at them, Russian books. <laughs>